Hello and welcome to another one of D's ADD videos. Today we're going to be discussing Lewis structures. Lewis structures are a convenient way to keep track of your valence electrons, whether in elements or simple bonding or even more complex bonding. It'll give you an idea of the structure as well, and more complex bonding. Later on, it'll be a stepping stone in order to find our hybridization. So if you really got to know your Lewis structure before you can move on to the next topic. All right, so let's look at Lewis structure for just the plain old elements. Well, first thing you need to do is you need to be able to find the number of valence electrons. And valence electrons are the electrons in your outermost shell. And they can be obtained by looking at the group number of your wonderful periodic table. Alright, oops, last part. So the column number or the group number will tell you how many valence electrons it has. So uh, group 1A have one valence electron. Uh, 2A, 2. Get the idea. all the way to our noble gases which have eight uh, valence electrons in a full outermost shell. Now what we do for the elements oxygen for instance has six valence electrons and what we do is we start putting them on each face one at a time and then we can start pairing them up. So that's what it would look like for the element of oxygen. Um, something like calcium would be uh, in the second column, right? So there's two valence electrons for calcium. So Just do something like that. Okay. That's for the elements. Now let's look at simple covalent bonding. If you remember in covalent bonding, what's going on is we're sharing the electrons um, equally. What happens in a covalent bond is the potential energy is at a minimum potential energy uh, this is distance that the two elements are to each other there's a lot of potential energy when they're really close together but there's a minimum area that occurs that's something like that right? and this minimal distance is the place in which you get your covalent bond. Okay, there's a region in which they don't attract each other or repel each other that much. Um, so let's look at hydrochloric acid, for instance. Two nonmetals, right? And what we do is we count up. The steps are going to be count your valence electrons. In this case, hydrogen has one, and chlorine has seven, so a total of eight valence electrons. 
So if we were to look at them element-wise, we put hydrogen there, and then if you remember chlorine, we would start doing that until we had our seven. And what happens here is these two here form a bond. Why my marker is trailing off like that this morning? But we form a covalent bond in which the single line represents two electrons. In this case, they're going to be bonding electrons. Okay. Um, sometimes we might get multiple bonds, like a carbon, oxygen, and oxygen, good old carbon dioxide, emitted by our cars every day. So if we did one, two, three, four, Six, something here. Right, because oxygen has six valence electrons. Carbon being in the fourth column has four. Six, 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 seven, eight, electrons. And uh, let's put the four around carbon. Okay. Um, and what's going to happen here is these two will form a covalent bond, so will these two. But this is not a stable compound. Carbon wants to have its octet filled, so does oxygen. That's known as the octet rule. And the octet rule basically is a rule that states that when sharing electrons in these covalent bonds, most atoms or most elements will want to have eight electrons surrounding them. So when sharing Some elements like hydrogen, who has a valence number of one and just one quantum number, can't accommodate eight electrons. So uh, we can't do that with uh, hydrogen or boron, for instance, or just some of the lower valence electrons would uh, not be possible. Um, so, how do we satisfy carbon's octet rule here? What can we do? Well, you see these electrons right here? And right here, they can form what's called a double bond. Oops. Uh, let's see. This one and that one would have to form a double bond. And I will go over carbon dioxide's Lewis structure in the more complex video. Example. Okay. Just for now, we're doing a little introduction on those structures and how we can deal with them. Alright. So that was all covalent bonding. Can we use Lewis structures for ionics? Sure, we can. Uh, let's see. If we have Na plus Cl, right? Uh, here, sodium being in the first column has just one valence electron, whereas our Na chlorine is going to look like that. And then here, what's going to happen if my screen doesn't fly all around the place? is we're going to get a cation for the sodium
and that anion for the oops. Okay, so we could even use them to represent ionic bonds. There will be a whole different video for the more complex compounds. So make sure you check that one out. There are a series of steps that you're going to go through in order to draw these guys. Okay. Um, And actually, I can go ahead and give you those steps right now. Step one count all valence electrons and add them up. Step 2. Draw a skeleton structure. Now, in the skeleton structure, you want the least electronegative element in the center. And if you remember, electronegativity increases as you go up and to the right on the periodic table. The fluorine being the most electronegative. So. Uh, the exception to this rule would be hydrogen, right? Because hydrogen can't form a um, more than one bond because of its limited number of valence electrons. And also, sometimes symmetry will force the more electronegative atom in the middle. And I'll show you an example on that later on if you check out oops having problems here if you check out the example videos so if you have three of one element and one more electronegative element, one more electronegative element is going to go in the middle because it has to form, form the um, multiple bonds and keep the outer or the other atoms in the outer periphery symmetrically around, arranged around them. Okay, after you do that, then you oh, running out of space there, it looks like. After you that you draw in the bonding electrons. And also lone pairs. Step four, calculate the formal charge. And then the final step is to see if it's valid. Okay, so after you do all that, step five, you you'll have multiple possible Lewis structures that fit the first four steps. Okay, so you want to check for most valid Lewis structure. And what qualifies it as being most valid? You want 
the fewest formal charges. number of bonds. Alright. So, make sure you practice a bunch of these because this is crucial for your understanding of hybridization. When we go over uh, that later on. So, Make sure you can do them for the elements and the single bonds and check out the example videos that uh, video for the more complex Lewis structures. These are the steps for that process. So uh, make sure you have these written down somewhere. Okay. Uh, they should be on the handouts as well that uh, are on the website. So I hope this has clarified any confusion that you might have. Thank you. Have a nice day.